Frank, as senior nights have the tendency to be kind of emotional or what have you. And uh, how difficult is it for a player to kind of shut that off, especially when you're a guy like Mike who will start and then, you know, shut that off and then try and go play the game? It's really hard. It's, uh, it's, it's probably the most difficult uh, game day prep uh, that I ever go through every single year. Um, and it's, it's complicated. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you're reminiscing on uh, guys that go through it for four years. It's a lot of practice time, a lot of games. Uh, a guy like Mike, a lot of success. You know, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike never experienced some of the difficulties that Michael Carrera and, and Sindaris and them experienced from a winning and losing standpoint. Um, yeah, but still, it, it doesn't change his journey, his his commitment, uh, and you know, and even with with uh, a guy like Makaya, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, uh, from a basketball game day um, um, experience, it hasn't gone the way he envisioned it or I envisioned it. But he's in that practice every day, giving us everything he's got. And, and, and the players, he's earned their respect. They, they, uh, they really enjoy him as a teammate. And, um, you know, you're always worried about winning the game. And then you're celebrating their careers right before the game's played. And uh, it's, it's a difficult, it's, it's, for me, it's really difficult. Uh, it's, you're, you got an emotional turmoil going on. Because um, your career is not technically over, but yet we're celebrating your career, and it, it uh, you know it really complicates it. And I get it, you know it's hard to uh, hard to figure out a way to bring in you know however number of people show up to the game to the arena to celebrate individual players unless it's for a game. So uh, I get it. Yes, you will. talked after the Alabama game about being upset with some of the fouls you guys what what is the biggest issue right now with fouling and how do you go about coaching that with with two games left I don't have an answer and if I gave you an answer probably get me in trouble and uh, it's hard to win on the road where you get outshot two to one every single time you play on the road uh, it's really hard to win that way and and if you're going to get outshot two to one every time you go on the road um, from the free throw line, then you got to make a lot of threes. Uh, I can't remember what game it was. Was it Arkansas? We made a bunch of no, it wasn't Arkansas. A and M. You know, we made like 15 threes. Um, you know, it's uh, and and then whatever minimal number of attempts you get, you got to make them. And I guess we what we missed nine. And we're in a two-point game with 10 seconds to go or whatever it was, and you've missed nine free throws. So it's not you, like us, we've missed nine free throws. Uh, once again, uh, missing free throws, you know, bites us in the rear end. But uh, I, I, I don't have – I've never been through this. This is year 13 for me as a head coach. My teams have always been in the top 20 in the country, free throws attempted. I'm, I'm, I'm not used to – being outshot two to one every time we play a road game. It's brand new to me. I, and, and do we commit some fouls? Yes, we do. Uh, but, you know, it's, I think I'll leave it at that, Colin, before I get myself in trouble. With Mike, you've always been a guy who's kept a, a close relationship with, with players once they leave. What, what, what do you envision that relationship with Mike being like? Would it be different than, than anybody else? And what's something that you'll always kind of remember about him when you reflect on his career 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that 15 foot jump shot. You know, if you look back to his freshman year, he made one to send us to like the most incredible moment this university's ever experienced in men's basketball. Uh, and if you keep hitting fast forward, his senior year has been just full of 15-foot jump shots. 
Um, and then his, his, uh, his courage uh, to, uh, a lot like Mendalgas and Michael, uh, you know, leave their families behind, come to a country uh, to, to learn uh, uh, the game of basketball, to, to play it competitively against the best. Um, and, and uh, you know, like I, you know, I've, I've challenged him a lot, especially the last two years. I've been uh, um, not as much this year, but last year I was really hard on him because he needed, he can be so good. And, and he just, he, he, he's always doubting in himself. And he never ran away from that. Uh, you know, he went through his journey, uh, which every, every one of their journeys is, you know, they're different. It's not, there's not a book that you can go to, you know, coach, go home frustrated, open up the book. Let me read chapter seven and see how you deal with Mike Coatsar and his journey. No, it's every journey is different. And you have to uh, go through it with that person. And uh, um, and he never never ran away, you know. Whether it was from not playing well, whether it's from the responsibilities, whether it's me down his throat to play better, um, uh, he he he's continued to grow, and that's all you ever ask for as a coach. And uh, to, uh, as to our relationship moving forward, I think he and I got a real good relationship. Uh, um, I don't expect it to be any different than it is with majority of those other guys, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you my relationship with every former player is great. It's not. Uh, but I think uh, um, the majority of them and I have unbelievable respect for each other. What's it been like seeing Mike interact with his family this these last few days? Yeah, that that's, you know, Josh, that's the, the part um, that um, it's a little different. You know, if you're from Georgia and you play South Carolina or you're from, uh, you know, Tennessee and you play in Texas somewhere, you know, it's a little different because uh, anytime there's a long weekend, you can always have access to your family if you choose to. Uh, when, when these kids come from uh, foreign countries and, and they're away from their families for long periods of time, I, I don't care how many times you FaceTime somebody, it's not the same as sitting there and giving them a hug, you know. It's uh, it's not the same as sitting there and 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 laughing at each other's jokes in person, uh, eating dinner with your family members. Um, special. It's uh, uh, it's what it's about. Uh, they're here for another week, I believe. They're here through the Vanderbilt game, so uh, so I'm I'm glad that that they were able to do that because uh, he's such a uh, Mike's a. a Big time family kid, big time family kid, and a lot like Carrera was, and no different than than the other guys we've asked. And Darius is a family guy, Dwayne's a family guy, but I'm talking about the international guys that they're away from their families for so much time. Um, it's uh, it's pretty special. Does the in it, in this case did the distance and or the language barrier affect the recruitment process in terms of just logistically how you recruited and how you developed a comfort level with his parents and their comfort level with you? Yeah, that that that's a little more difficult when you recruit them directly from their countries to come to the United States. But the ones like Mike that make the decision to come to high school in the United States. That re the recruitment there is a little different. You don't have to overcome that challenge that you just brought up. Uh, that challenge was already uh, uh, addressed, and everyone's at peace with it to go to the high school. Uh, and, and then once it's college, it's it's kind of you know best opportunity for them academically. Uh, uh, most European kids, uh, choice of a major is a is is huge in their recruitment. Um, and uh, luckily for us, uh, basketball, academia, socially, um, you know, weather. Estonia is a really cold city. It's country, excuse me. Um, it's uh, um, being able to go to school somewhere where you don't have to deal with. Mike loves the beach, loves the water. Uh, going to school somewhere where, you know, weather is more conducive to being warm than cold. Uh, had a lot to do with it. Kind of, it was a uh, his recruitment was pretty easy from that standpoint. Along with what I've expressed before, you know, my relationship with uh, the club team coach at his hometown, who 
his family fully trusts and, and, and uh, the, the level of trust that exists between he and I just made it more comfortable and a lot easier in the recru recruitment process. Kind of a two-parter here. First, what was it about Mike that in his freshman year kind of led you to say, this is a guy we can rely on as much as you guys ended up doing? And as a coach, what is sort of the level of satisfaction of seeing a guy who you were really hard on for two years kind of deliver and blossom in his last chapter as a Gamecock? Um, his freshman year, it was just, uh, you don't play guys you like. You play guys that, that accept responsibility. And he accepted responsibility better than <clears throat> other freshmen or first-year players on that team. And um, that team had a void because of what had happened the year before with the guys that didn't, stick, didn't stay here uh, with the BB gun situation. Um, so that team had a void for a front, you know, front court player. And there were three or four guys that had an opportunity, and he was the most responsible uh, with attention to detail of all those guys. So that's why he got the nod to go. And, uh, and then he, he never did anything to lose it. Uh, he, he, his teammates trusted him. Coaches trusted him. Um, we wanted him to do more. But as a freshman that surrounded with so many really, – think about the guys that he was surrounded by. Sindarius, PJ, Dwayne, Chris. I mean, real good players. And, and they took on all the responsibility. So uh, he was at peace with – a lot of guys want more responsibility, but they're not prepared for it. So when you don't give them more responsibility, they, they get frustrated. Mike was at peace with the responsibility that was given to him for that team, and that's, that's kind of why he played so much as a freshman. And as a coach, it's uh, – uh, uh, whether you yell at them or you don't play them much or you yank them in and out of games or they have a career where they play 38 minutes a game or they have a career where they play three minutes a game. All that is different with each player. All that is irrelevant for what really matters, their growth. That's the only thing that matters. Because when Mike is done here in a couple months and gets his degree and walks out the door, he's in real life. It's no longer Frank being hard on him. No, life is going to be hard on him every day for the rest of his life. Not Frank, life. So hopefully we've helped prepare him so he can handle adversity. Because that's the older you get, the more adversity you have, not, let, not the other way around. So he can handle adversity so he can continue on his journey for success. And, and that's what we try to do. That's, that's, that's when I sleep good at night, has nothing to do with the score of the game. It's because of that right there. Uh, Frank, over the last two years, just seeing the way that Coatsart's been able to develop offensively and even just seeing Chris, just the, the step that he took, Chris Silver, from his junior to senior year, uh, what is it about some of these big guys that have played for you? I'm not trying to I – know, I know you won't give yourself too much credit, but what is it about some of these big guys that have stayed with you for four years and just turning uh, that page and being a, a, a better presence on offense? Um, I, I – you know, Mike, I'm not – I don't want to isolate it just the big guys because so I think those guards develop really nice too. And um, I, when I played, that's where I played. Um, you know, I played with my back to the basket, and um, and it was about screening and rebounding and doing all that stuff that nobody teaches at the high school. I shouldn't say nobody; very few still teach and demand at the high school level. Um, so I have an appreciation for guys that do that, whether it was uh, Limonis's development or Michael Carrera's development or, you know, uh, to Chris, to, I mean, every one of our bigs, to Mike, and um, I think they all get better, the guys that, that stick around here. Um, we, we utilize our bigs in how we play, so, so there's a, there's a, it's, it's, I don't know. I can tell you this. If I was a big and all I was asked to do is run around and set ball screens, I'd probably quit playing. And, you know, because we, we give them an opportunity to do something than run around and ball screen. I think they, they respect that, so they come in and work more and more and more. Um, uh, but, but everything that's happened is directly connected 
to them seeing the guys before them and, and learning from the guys before them. And, uh, you know, Chris learned from Michael Mendogas and Lamonis when he was a freshman, uh, how they worked. Um, we, we obviously expressed their journey to him while we recruited him, so he's aware of the progress they made. Uh, you know, and then, you know, Sundarius and, and so then Chris learned to be patient and work. And, and I think Mike has done the same. And, and hopefully there's a bunch of guys on this team that, that are learning from Mike and his journey. And, and they find the patience and the willingness to work uh, to allow themselves to develop at whatever pace it is that they're supposed to develop. Steering away from Mike a little bit, but Justin has his meeting with the doctors this week. I guess, what's the plan for that? If he is able to go, do you just work him right back into practice, or how does that kind of play out? Yeah, it, it's it, – it, you know, when it comes to injuries, you're, you're either pregnant or you're not. I, does that make sense what I'm saying? I mean, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think other than Emily, any of us in this room really comprehend what that means. But, but those of us that are parents, I think we understand how we feel that they were told uh, it's happening. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I, I would think that he's either going to be cleared to give it a go or he's going to be told you're not ready. I, that, that like, well, well let's – that, you know – I, I, minute restrictions, load management, all that nonsense. I, I, what, what's a minute restriction on an athlete that has an injury? Like, okay, so he plays 15 minutes, he's not getting hurt. But if he plays 18, he is getting hurt. I, I've never comprehended that one. I, you know, it's either they can go or they can't. And if they can go, I'm, uh, what I do understand is that when he does get cleared, and if, if it happens this week, uh, when would it be Wednesday, that there's some kind of cast that they can put on it. And if that's the way it works, I mean, then he's ready and cleared to go. That's the way I look at it. It's the way it's been explained to me. If he's not, it's not like, okay, he can only practice for 30 minutes, but he can't play in games. I, 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 I can't see it being like that. And if it is, I would not understand what that means. Is that – did I answer your question? There was a moment in the in the Alabama game when you guys had kind of closed in and, and Keyshawn maybe went a little too fast, kind of tr try and take that shot. It, is that a thing that can be a learning experience for a mm -hmm. younger player down the road, getting in that situation and, and learning to maybe dial it back a little bit? Or you're talking about that play towards the end of the game? Yeah, yeah it's it's unfortunate that. Uh, that he missed the shot, and then he grabbed his own rebound and it went through his hands. But that's a learning moment for Key. Key's always the guy that runs ahead of people and tries to dunk the ball. That's what he's always done. He's never been the guy with the ball making decisions. And this year, his journey is to grow as the guy with the ball making the decisions. And he's had some turnovers as we've gone through the season trying to make plays, and I've been patient with it because he's got to learn to do it. I mean, you're not going to be a running dunker your whole career and expect to have a long career. Uh, that's who he is, but he's got to become a better basketball player. And to become better, as long as they work, as long as they listen, as long as they're competitive, I've got to kind of let them go a little bit. The guys that don't work and, and don't want to listen, i got no problem with that. But their margin for error is about that big and they're getting taken out of the game. The guys that actually try to do the things that we ask, then you got to let them go. And, you know, usually you don't succeed before you fail. And the ones that don't, then don't know how to handle failure because we're all going to deal with failure. And so you got to let them go a little bit. And, and he's, he's had mistakes because he's been over aggressive. And he's got to learn when to be aggressive and when not as aggressive. But there's only one way to figure that out. But that play there, it's, I mean, uh, uh, after it happened, I was yelling past the ball because A.J. was running ahead of him on the left wing. and He could have passed and gotten it back. Uh, but you know what? Bless his heart. He had the courage to go make a play, and it just didn't happen for him. And uh, I think he'll be a lot better for it. And, and um you know, it, it's when I when I went back and watched the film, you know, he, he kind of short arms a shot a little bit, but it goes off the backboard and it's him and the ball. 
and it goes right through his hands. I'm more upset at, when I watch a film at his inability to retrieve the rebound than I was on the decision to shoot the basketball. Frank, I think this is the first time you guys have played on a Tuesday night in two months, I think, since you opened, right? It's, it's, been, it's been really consistent, the Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. Um, I, I know a lot of athletes and coaches get into a rhythm, and that's kind of developed success. Is that hard to kind of all of a sudden go almost eight straight weeks of Wednesday, Saturday, then all of a sudden you have this Tuesday game at the end of the, at the, end of the year? Everyone else plays on Tuesday every once in a while, you know, except us. I guess... Setting up our schedule is pretty easy. Just kind of put them to the side. When we get to them, we'll get to them. All right, just take them in wherever they fit. And I guess we fit on every Wednesday and every Saturday. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, in the Big Twelve, we used to have the Monday Saturday turn, and you'd get a couple of those a week, a couple at least two. So you're prepared, and uh, it's a huge advantage for the teams that play on Monday and Tuesday. Like in the Big 12 is Monday, here is Tuesday, on Saturday. It's a huge advantage because you get the rest. Is that, and then you got to play two games in a quick window, which no one has a problem with that because it's, it's the same on both teams. Does that make sense? If you're playing on, well, this will be Tuesday, everybody's playing Saturday. So both teams are on that quick turn. Uh, but then you gain an advantage for the following Saturday because you get Wednesday off. Um, and, um, you know, in the Big 12, we used to love that Saturday-Monday turn, because that, especially when you got later in the year, because now you can take Tuesday off. Then Wednesday, you can kind of manage them a certain way, which allows them to be at peace, and then you get your two days of prep for Saturday. So, uh, and having one day of prep between games, that prepares you for postseason basketball because that's the way postseason is played if you're worthy of making that tournament. So um, it's the first time we do it. I, I, I think we played Florida on a Tuesday. Is that correct? And, uh, but that was coming off uh, that wonderful Stetson performance that Josh will never let me forget about. Um, you know, that's coming off that performance where we had a whole week to prepare. Uh, so, uh, so this is the first time we got to prepare for a Tuesday turn. So, uh, I, I think we've managed it the right way, and I think our guys will play well. Compared Jermaine a little bit to Sundarius over the course of the season, I'm just curious, kind of how how close does he mirror Sundarius? Maybe that freshman year, and how have you managed him as of late? Yeah, it, it's if you look at their stats, they're very similar. And they got very similar personalities. Uh, uh, they, 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 they're both very um, uh, confident in what they do. Uh, they both, uh, uh, at the same point in their careers, are learning. Like, you know, Sindarius was identified earlier in the conference season. Jermaine's been identified now. And he's probably enemy number one on everyone's scouting report as they're getting ready to play us. So. Uh, he's learning how to handle that, and that's probably why he has not played as well here for the last three or four games. Uh, his will's still good, but he's starting to understand how to be public enemy number one. And um, so it's uh, they're they're very similar as people. They're very similar uh, with their confidence. They're very similar statistically um, uh, to one another. So um, I'm not trying to compare him to Sin. Um, I just uh, when I did that, I was just trying to give you guys a uh, uh, kind of behind the scenes feel for what he's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, to be around every single day. Uh, I hope his career ends up like Sindarius's. I hope his growth ends up like Sindarius's. And obviously, I hope our success is tied into his growth, like our success here was tied to Sindarius. I guess this will be the last time we get to speak to you in this setting before all as, or all SEC ballots by coaches are, are submitted. Uh, you, you've talked about Mike being a SEC Defensive Player of the Year kind of guy. When when you think of big men, a lot of a lot of folks think of shot blockers mm -hmm. and not just ball screen defense. You know, Mike's down at tenth in in, in blocks, so he's he's up there. But what kind what 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 makes Mike? Uh, SEC Defensive Player of the Year to you, 
um, not necessarily compared to other guys, but his skill set compared to some other guys? Well, let's start with the players he's got around him, a bunch of freshmen. So if we, up until the last two games, actually the last two games our field goal percentage defense has been okay, just too many free throws. Um, we were number one field goal percentage defense in the league up until a couple games ago. I don't know if we're still there or not. Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, we've been top 20 in the country for a while. How are you doing that with nothing but freshmen? I'd like to tell you because I'm some kind of genius. I can guarantee you that's not the case. Um, am I stubborn? Yes. Am I at peace with what we teach? Yes. Someone's anchoring that defense. And if that defense is really good, someone's responsible for it. We've been uh, among the best defensive teams in the country his whole career here. And he's the common link, always on the court for that. And uh, so uh, I, I think number one is uh, if he had the reputation coming into the season that others have, I think it'd be game over. It's his award. Uh, but he didn't have the reputation because I, I, I really stink at promoting individual players. It's, I've never been good at it. I'm, I'm about winning games. I'm about promoting our team. I'm not into promoting individuals. I, I, I'm not good at it. Uh, I, it's, uh, I know if I'm player B on a team and all coach does is promote player A, eventually I'm going to have some kind of resentment. Like, why don't he ever talk about me? You know, so I'm, I'm not. That's the way I look at it. So I'm not good at it. I think there's other people that should be doing that, uh, uh, but it, it's not the way I do business either. So I don't pressure people to do that because I, I want it to be about our team. Um, um, but I, he's good. I, I, I don't know how to. Uh, he, you know, a lot of times defensive player of the year is the steals guy. Well, the steals guy goes after steals. That's a selfish play if he's getting broken down every single time down the court and exposing his team to problems. You could have great steals. There's been some of the great steals guys have been some of the worst defenders. And so you got to be careful there. It's, uh, um, you know, Mike's always in the right place. You know, always in the right place. He hasn't blocked a lot of shots lately uh, as much as he was earlier in the year. Uh, but, you know, I think we're pretty good defensively and we're doing it with a bunch of freshmen. Um, and and someone's responsible for that. And I, I, I don't mean to regurgitate what I just said. Uh, I'd like to sit here and tell you that I'm really good. I, I don't. It's him. He's the reason. He's the reason that that we've been that good defensively because he's such a good. He's not a, just an individual good defender. He's the best team defender uh, in the league. And uh, you could say other people might be better than him individually. But I really doubt that there's somebody that's as good a team defender as him.